Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all of the sponsors of our patient engagement series, including MITRE, EY, Signify Health, and Publicis Health. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from MITRE, Seshan Rajput. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy days to join us. I'm Zeeshan Rajput, and I have the pleasure to be uh, the moderator for this panel. I'm joined by a fantastic group of panelists, and I'll be welcoming each of them to the virtual stage here in just a few seconds. We're each going to take about a minute or so, introduce ourselves to you. We're then going to launch into a, uh, a conversation amongst the panel. As was just mentioned, there is a Q&A feature available. Please feel free to send in those questions. We'll be taking a look at those and getting to as many of those as we can get to during today's session. To begin, I'll introduce myself. I'm by background a uh, physician specializing in adult hospital medicine and informatics. And in the context of today's conversation, in addition to being a principal at the MITRE Corporation, I'm also the chief clinical lead of MITRE's efforts regarding oncology, including some of the things we'll be talking about today, such as M-Code and the Codex community. But with that, let me turn it to the first of our panelists. So Sharon, I would welcome you to come off of mute and introduce yourselves to the audience today. Hi, everyone. I'm Sharon Hensley Alford. I'm a PhD cancer epidemiologist and very um, interested in data standards and medical data um, analysis for helping uh, patients. Uh, I am the co-founder and the CIO of uh, Cancer Insights. Great, thank you, Sharon. And our second panelist that I have the pleasure to introduce today is Grace. Grace, if you don't mind coming off mute and introducing yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grace Cordobano, and I'm a board certified patient advocate specializing in the oncology space. My day to day is working with patients and their families from point of diagnosis through survivorship or end of life care planning. I help families work through all of the nuances and difficulties and barriers to be able to make an informed, empowered decision about their care, their treatment, and their life with a diagnosis. Um, in order to be able to participate and be an engaged patient, an active patient, an informed patient, you need access to credible information, seamless access to actionable data. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. As are we, Grace, thank you so much. Finally, I have the pleasure of introducing Larry. Larry, if I can bring you to the virtual stage and ask you to say hello. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Jason. Uh, my name is Larry Shulman. I'm a medical oncologist and clinically a breast cancer specialist. I'm the deputy director for clinical services for the Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania. I've been involved in health informatics uh, now, I guess, for almost 30 years, since the early 1990s. Uh, in the early days of the creation of electronic health records and other facilitators of uh, cancer care. And one of the things that I would just mention is that as I've watched this process and participated in the process over those 30 years, cancer care has become incredibly more complex, um, making it more of a challenge for us to deliver high quality care. I'd also say, um, though that uh, we've lost some opportunities to use data and electronic health records optimally. And I guess we'll talk a little bit about that as the session goes on, but it's uh, very much an area of my interest. Brilliant. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Being that this uh, series of webinars is dedicated to patient engagement, I was hoping we could start today's conversation there. Uh, we've got such a wealth of experiences and backgrounds. And so what I'd like to ask is from each of your perspectives, how do you feel the engagement of patients is with the healthcare ecosystem today? And if you could think about one or two things that you would particularly highlight in terms of either uh, uh, difficult areas and opportunities for focus or, or perhaps ample opportunities just waiting for the next thing. Uh, so Sharon, uh, again, I'd love to start yeah. with you. 
yeah. a little bit about what patient engagement looks like from your perspective. So I think um, I, I share a lot of my uh, of the same perspective as Grace and have walked alongside a number of patients, family and friends through the cancer journey. And I wanna echo what Grace said that the biggest challenge for patients is information. And in some ways it's over information um, and in some ways it's the lack of information. And let me explain that because for patients who are newly diagnosed, they are often bombarded with a whole lot of information all at one time, which can be very overwhelming um, as you're dealing with sort of, you're be dealing with, you know, the emotional uh, impact of the diagnosis as well as trying to understand the complexity. So I think there's some failure there in terms of how we present um, information to patients at the point of diagnosis and as they move through their cancer journey. And um, lack of information because until recently with the um, MU3, um, patients haven't had the opportunity to, you know, pull all of their data from multiple systems into a single source so that they can have a, uh, a very summarized and easy to consume um, synopsis of their case. And that's really important for patients who are not in integrated delivery networks uh, where their care may be um, you know, dispersed across multiple providers who are not connected. And they have to take on the burden of sharing that information across providers. And so in that way, I feel like there's a, a huge um, uh, opportunity. Um, and that is all based, based on the new um, legislation that has just gone into effect that allows patients through third-party APIs to be able to pull their information and have access to that information, I think is huge. Um, it offers patients um, other avenues for navigation and for um, you know, new ways of being able to access and understand and consume that, that data. Fantastic. Uh, I'd love to go a little bit deeper on one comment you made about the experience of patients in integrated data, uh, data uh, delivery centers versus the experience of those that are not in integrated delivery centers. How do you feel like if you could think of one as an ideal and one as an aspirational, what do you think some of the differences are for patients that undergo journeys in different sorts of ecosystems? Right. So I, um, in um, earlier part of my career, was a part of um, an integrated delivery network where it covered everything from um, primary care through specialty care and everything was in-house and there was a common medical record. So it was very easy for there to be information sharing uh, between, you know, the um, medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, surgery, um, social work, the nurse navigator, all of that um, sort of coordination was easier in an integrated delivery network. But I've worked with patients who are not part of an integrated delivery network where they are, they go to different um, independent uh independent practices to receive the different components of their cancer care. And in that case, that, that integration of information often comes to rely on the patient. And I think Grace from her um, experience in working with um, the, the, the very diverse patient population that she works with um, could speak a lot to, her, to the patient experience in this uh, respect. Grace, you want Grace, to Grace, sounds in? like it's over to you. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you, Sharon. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, cancer care is really complicated. Um, as someone who years ago was misdiagnosed with advanced cancer and uh, navigated the journey um, to a second opinion, was able to find out that thankfully it was a misdiagnosis, um, this situation brought me to my knees. Um, being able to have access to your medical records is a must. It is not a nice to have. And I want to point out something that happened during COVID in that many people lost their jobs. Um, people had to move maybe to go care for other families. 
they got sick while they were traveling, they got sick while, or while they were visiting others in other countries, didn't have access to records. Having that access at your fingertips is a necessity that most people don't have. COVID also taught us that because of the insurance changes associated with, with job loss, right? So now you're switching from one hospital system or integrated system to another type of provider. Moving those records is an extreme burden. So having a earth shattering diagnosis is bad enough, but we never talk about the administrative burden and the work that people need to do to get the care that their doctors have prescribed. It's from coordination of care. We're talking about appealing insurance denials, applying for social security disability benefits, um, um, entering and researching the clinical trial space, trying to see um, if you qualify for a precision uh, medicine based trial, you need access to your records in order to be able to navigate that and there's a huge missed opportunity to teach people and coach them the power of their medical records, what they need to do with them, how they can really hack the system and really what to have that plan B and plan C should you ever need it. We also forget about the care partners. Those are the people that are really doing the heavy lifting and supporting their loved ones when they're maybe too sick or just not able to participate in their care. And a lot of times in immigrant populations and more marginalized communities, it's the children and young adults. I was one of those children. My family um, came here from Poland. And while I was born here, I did not speak English until I started school. And once I got the hang of it, I was the one navigating it. So I encourage everyone to not forget about the care partners as well as the young adults who may have more English proficiency and better digital literacy than their loved ones. And I think too, um, uh, Larry can speak from the clinical point, point of view because I think clinicians in the, in the barriers that have been in, um, in terms of information sharing, um, have a, impacted clinicians as well in providing the best patient experience because clinicians also have not had access to the full information. So they often are, are stuck with having only a view of what they within their within their realm um, have have done and interacted with the patient and not had access to you know care that has occurred or images that have occurred in other places when that impacts the the care journey for the patient the patient's experience in oncology as well because there may be repeat imaging that needs to be done because you can't get those images that have, were done in another um, location fast enough because in cancer care, we often need to move quicker to help these patients. And clinicians work without kind of blind um, sometimes by not having that information, um, that whole picture. And um, MU3 has also allowed clinicians to have the, the right through third-party APIs to be able to pull information from medical records, um, uh, you know, on the, if they're treating um, a patient, they have the right to be able to do that through third-party um, API integration. And I know there's a question about whether or not this is aspirational or whether this is real. And I can tell you that at our company, at my company, we are making it real. We are making it real. We can, um, for either the patient side or the clinician side, we can pull records for patients and um, for patients uh, across the United States, identify what health systems they've been in and pull that data aggregated into an oncology specific um, case summary that makes it easy to digest both for the patient and for the clin clinician. Well, thank you both. I think we've got a lot to dive deeper on. Larry, perhaps we can start with the last comment and talk a little bit about the physician's experience and this information rich and yet sometimes poor world that we live in. Yeah, so Sharon and Grace have obviously made some key points here. If you flip to the other side of the coin, which is, you know, what happens to me when I'm sitting in a room with a patient and her family and trying to get the information that I need to really totally understand what her situation is, uh, to explain it to her, um, and to then make uh, the appropriate recommendations for treatment. And all of that is dependent upon having the right data 
and having it easily available to you. And unfortunately, not only is our data scattered over multiple health systems that aren't connected with different EHRs and so on, but much of it is either in text, which you can't mine, or for instance, if a patient of mine has their initial biopsy of their cancer at another hospital, what I get is a PDF that gets scanned into my record somewhere um, that's hard to find in the best of days, uh, but is not really accessible as searchable data. Uh, and so if I wanted to type into my electronic record to find out what the specifics of the biopsy showed, what that woman had in, the, in her cancer that would help me to understand how best to treat her, I've got to find that PDF and read through the whole thing rather than the data being there in a structured format that gets presented to me in a way that I'm much less likely to miss something um, or to go in the wrong direction. And that affects even all the healthcare that occurs in my own institution because electronic health records have become very complicated. I'm sure Sharon and Grace have some comments about what physicians note uh, from clinic look like these days, uh, but they've become very burdensome uh, and often pretty hard to understand really what's happened. Um, they're frankly billing notes um, and, um, and not notes that are organized in a way to easily communicate the information that's key. I'm a great believer in structured data because if I have structured data, I can present it to the clinician and frankly, I can share it that way with the patient. It's much more understandable. It's not lost uh, in prose and other documents. And it can also help me with decision support. Um, if a patient's tumor has a particular genomic mutation, um, you know, right now, um, that information is scanned somewhere in a document from an outside laboratory that I have to search for. Again, it's not structured data. I don't know how you would find it. Um, and the electronic health record, I can barely find it. But it's not their instruction data that jumps out at me and says, Mrs. Jones' tumor has such and such mutation, leading me to know that treatment X is the best treatment for her. So we have a lot of unrealized opportunities here uh, that I think we can uh, take advantage of that would both help the clinicians who are caring for the patients and also present the data to the patient, and also that would allow us from APIs or other mechanisms to transfer critical data in an understandable way to other people who are caring for the patient. Uh, right now, all of that's pretty cumbersome. And I, yeah, so two, two points based on what uh, Larry's comments. And one is that, you know, the patient um, may not be a good historian. And so, if the patient isn't a good historian, um, it, that also adds burden. So by providing technology that allows patients to capture their journey in a way that they can present it to their clinician, um, alleviates that burden of the patient, you know, being the main historian of the case. The other thing that I think that um, Larry addressed here was talking about how the data, even if you have it electronically within the record, may not be accessible. And I think we've seen some of the, the bigger uh, companies try to solve this problem by creating these um, almost black box algorithms that are um, to to almost try and replace the clinician and help, you know, tell the clinician what decision to make. And that's not the way that I see the problem being solved. I think the problem needs to be solved based on what um, Larry said, which is the structured data. So being able to take that unstructured information, regardless of the source, put it into a structured, well-formatted um, uh, um, summary that, gives the clinician all of the pieces of information that they need in order to make that decision and allowing them to also be able to look at the source document so that there isn't a black box um, and know if I need to be able to move to that um, source document to verify, you know, that this information has been properly surfaced for me, I can easily do that. Um, 
And, and with the MU3 changes, I think we're gonna see um, huge strides um, to make this type of information easier. Clinicians don't want to have to look through that 400 page PDF to find the, the, the key pieces of information that they need to make a decision, a treatment decision and guide the patient. And uh, they, they just don't have the time. And then this is causing a lot of clinician burnout. And it, there's a lot of, I think what we talk about, we're talking about the patient experience, but you can't talk about the patient experience and ignore the clinician's experience. Because to me, they're very linked. Um, th that journey is taken side by side between the two, and you need to support both sides, uh, the patient and the clinician, in that information um, sharing and throughout the journey from diagnosis through survivorship. Could I, could I just make a personal comment about that? You know, when I'm sitting in the room with a patient, um, and I'm struggling with the electronic health records and stuff on the screen um, in the room and trying to find something. I can spend X number of minutes trying to find that document staring at the computer screen where I can have the data presented to me in a very efficient way and look the patient in the eye and the family in the eye and devote my time to talking to them without appearing and at being distracted by trying to find what is hard. I mean, it changes the patient experience, I think. It certainly changes my experience to have the data readily available. The other reality, quite frankly, is it wouldn't be that much of a problem, I suppose, if I was seeing one or two patients a day, but all of us see a lot of patients a day. And, um, you know, and that makes finding the data on any given patient more challenging because you only have a certain amount of time you're not going to keep the patients waiting there all day long, at least I try not to. And, um, you know, so efficiency is not only just for the efficiency's sake, it's making sure that you don't miss data that are critical in understanding the patient's disease and decision making. Um, so it's really, really important, but it also, at least to me, affects the interaction in the room with the patient and with the patient's family. I do want to make one other comment, if I could, because I'd be very curious about Sharon and Grace's comments. We've been very interested in Penn and uh, other people elsewhere about uh, patient reported outcomes. You know, these are um, uh, questionnaires uh, that the patients fill out at Penn. Um, they're electronically transmitted in structured data into our EHR presented in, I think, a very accessible format to our clinicians. And there are several studies now in the literature that show that just by asking the patients to contribute their patient-reported outcomes, not only do the patients do better from the symptom point of view, they actually live longer. Um, and you know, it's an incredibly powerful way for us to get from you the things that we need to know in ways that aren't going to allow us to forget what we need to ask. Right. right? And again, I'd like to get, I'd like to tell you, I'd never forget ask a particular question. You know, right. You know, and this really, I think, has proved to um, really benefit patients. I'd be curious in your, your thoughts about that as well. Yeah, I agree um, with you, Larry. I think the data also shows that patients, like following up on patient reported outcomes also decreases the overall cost because you can um, eliminate ER visits um, and extra care that costs more by addressing early uh, patient reported outcomes. So I think this is a key. And I think there's a real role for um, technology here because it can also deepen the patient engagement by soliciting this type of information and by taking that information and being able to present it to the clinician in a you know efficiently readable and consumable format um, so that the, the clinician can uh, be with the patient, like Larry said, and spend time looking in their eye 
and being confident, um, which gives the patient confidence and improves the and improves the experience because you know the the clinician is assured of of having all the information that he or she needs um, to address what's important for the patient and make the best decisions. I just want to follow up, Larry, when you were talking about searching for something on the computer, I think most of the general public would be appalled and shocked to hear that doctors don't have all that information, that things that we're talking about are wrongly assumed by the general public and most patients, because we figure, well, all this sophisticated testing is being done and my doctor has everything. And what I regularly hear, if I don't attend a uh, appointment with a patient, I ask, oh, Mr. So-and-so, how was your appointment? The doctor didn't even look up. I waited for this appointment for three months. They were just noodling around on their computer um, and documented a few things and, and just couldn't wait to get out the door. So that's the unfortunate perception in many cases, but they don't realize how hard it is to try to get all of these pieces of the puzzle to try to come up with the gold standard treatment that's necessary to care for as best as possible for that person. And on the topic of PROs, oncology is an excellent example for this, specifically for something like management of treat and related side effects. We know that there's a gamut of different things that can go wrong and different toxicities and side effects. And it's been reported repeatedly that by monitoring the patterns and the severity and by not waiting until things spiral out of control, as Sharon was saying, where we need an emergency room, where someone collapses and falls and breaks something, um, being able to bring palliative care or make adjustments in doses or and manage different types of side effects with different interventions, you know, having a nurse navigator contact the patient before literally all hell breaks loose it helps the patient, it improves quality of life, it supports dignity and allows, um, I, I don't like the word treatment, uh, uh, compliance and adherence, yeah. but it improves that as well. So um, perfect example for PROs and I'm shocked that we're not pushing that more. People can do it. Patients are not, yeah. this stigma about being a patient that we're not capable, but there's also loved ones that would catch a grenade for their loved one, would be happy also yeah. to, to, to submit those PROs. I agree. And I think you make a very good point, Grace, about bringing in the observations of the caregivers because they, they're they they're watching their loved ones very closely. I know when my sister was going through um, stage four breast cancer, I was very attuned to any changes in her, you know, how she was feeling in her day-to-day -day behavior. If, you know, reporting pain or having more pain or, you know, any little thing I was very attuned to. So I, I think that's a really important point in, in terms of PROs, including caregivers. Larry, I think I might've cut you off. No, that's okay. Uh, it was well worth hearing what you had to say. Um, somebody in the chat asked about references. I'll just say that there's uh, one of our colleagues, Ethan Bash, B-A-S-C-H, um, who's done some of the most important, I think, PRO studies and you could Google scholar him and, and finds his articles. But one of them, which was done in France, probably because it could not be done in the US, which is a whole nother story, uh, was where patients with lung cancer were randomized to get CT scans every three months uh, to six months as the standard of care, or not do the scans, but just send them PRO questionnaires every week. And it goes to what Grace and Sharon were saying, which is patients know when things aren't going well, Mm -hmm. Rather than waiting three months for your next scan, if you know things aren't going well next week, uh, wouldn't it be better to find out then? And in that study, the patients who were monitored with PROs and not scans actually lived significantly longer. Uh, just as an um, uh, just as evidence to show that just asking the patient actually is pretty important. That might sound dumb, but uh, it's taken us a long time to figure that out. I did want to make one other comment uh, because a lot of what I've done in my career is try to learn uh, from the patients we treat uh, what goes well and what doesn't go well and how we can provide better care, how we can learn from what we're doing. And as everybody knows, a lot of the knowledge that we get uh, about cancer care and the other care is from clinical trials, um, which um, take a long time to complete. Uh, and are really critical in us understanding what works and what doesn't work. But the reality is 
that clinical trials focused on patients um, were not necessarily like the average patient with cancer. You get on a clinical trial, you have to have perfect liver function, perfect kidney function, perfect heart function, and so on. And many of the patients who we treat, in fact, have other issues um, and um, end up doing differently with the therapies that they did on the clinical trial. And that's so-called real-world data or real-world evidence. And we are wasting an opportunity here in the sense that um, we have electronic health records of millions of patients who are undergoing cancer treatment at lots of centers like mine. And we don't have the structured data that we could pull out with the flip of a switch that would allow us to really understand how patients who are treated with therapy A or therapy B did. Um, and if in fact we hadn't had patient reported outcomes as well, we'd know not only about length of survival, we'd know about quality of life, um, which I don't have to tell you is, you know, at least as important as length of survival. And right now, for most of the clinical trials we do, we don't have that. We know that patients will live a certain length of time on treatment A or treatment B, but we don't know how they did. You know, we, we don't know what they were able to do during this treatment. So if we had better structured data in the HR, we could live time continue to learn from the patients who are undergoing therapy now and have a much more rapid approach to so-called rapid cycle improvement to help us treat the next cohort of patients better than we're treating them today. We're missing that opportunity. I completely agree with you, Larry. And what I like to say is we need to move from real world evidence to real time evidence. And that means that having that data available for clinicians at the point of decision making that includes all everything that's happened to the patient and the decisions and up to you know the minute or the day, having that data available to clinicians to see like within my practice, um, within my patient set, or maybe even uh, um, an anonymized data set that covers you know, multiple health systems to be able to share that data with clinicians um, so that they can see you know, what, what is going on. And there's um, a lot of work um, um, looking at what we call, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but her, um, Miguel Hernan has done a lot of work where you can match patients and look at the counterfactuals, that's like a very powerful analysis um, technique that could be used in real-time evidence to be able to say what, um, what type of um, decision should I make based on the current evidence uh, for this patient. And the key to that as we keep coming back around to is having those standardized data elements. And so I think the work that um, MITRE is doing with MCODE and pushing these data standards is really key um, in medicine. And there's a lot of effort that needs to be done to standardize the data in terms of um, all of the metrics and, that are needed per cancer, because it's not the same across all cancers as well as being able to standardize things like how we report imaging, standardize how we report um, uh, treatment cycles. There's no standard that currently exists. I know that hemonc.org is trying to push a standard for how chemotherapy um, regimens are um, reported, but we don't have that. So we need to have these underlying um, standards built in order to be able to move to, you know, the vision that we can see right now. Well, I would, I would like to just build on that, you know, the real-time data con concept that Darren's mentioning. You know, nothing really revealed our inadequacies in that regard more than COVID. Um, yes. In the first six months of the pandemic, uh, oncologists like myself were trying to figure out what the risks were to our patients to contract COVID, what was going to happen to them if they got COVID, which um, you know impacted immune systems, uh, and so on. And we had no data, and to get that data was very, very difficult. And we did not get it in a timely fashion that we really needed it. Um, and if we had been in 
a different situation with structured data that could be extracted from our EHR. As we could have been much smarter, much sooner in the pandemic and how to optimally care for our patients. So I think that's um, really, really critical. Uh, and so I appreciate you bringing that up. Larry, I yep. want to kind of comment on that. Sorry, Sharon. Go you know, ahead. What you bring up also, we haven't talked about this, the disparities and inequities in cancer care. Many patients don't have access and can't travel and, uh, and afford care at a center of excellence in New York City or out in California or ac across the different locations in the U.S. And how do we best support those oncologists, our rural, our community yes. health centers yes. with these findings. And I think Dana Farber has clinical care pathways in oncology, which is intriguing, but why do we not have this? The data is there and we can better support our oncologists and care teams and nurse practitioners and cancer centers that are serving some of the most vulnerable marginalized communities with real-time data and information. So everyone, not just those at centers of excellence, everyone gets cutting edge care because we, we, we are bursting at the scenes with data and we're really not maximizing how accessible and actionable we're making it. I want to um, add to that, Grace, because we know that only 20% of cancer patients are actually going to large, getting treated at large cancer centers. So there's 80% of patients, 80% of that data that is um, available from across the country in these smaller um, communities that is really valuable to um, highlighting the, the experience overall. And I think that patients would be very um, surprised to learn that when you go to ask your doctor how many patients like me, and that doesn't have to include my age, my comorbidities, my race and my gender and all of these things, just how many patients my stage and histology have you treated? They can't answer that. There's no information available to them at that point to say, I've treated this many patients who have, you know, this stage, your stage in histology. And I, I you know, for what we can do for what we are able to do in so many other sectors um, of our economy with the data, it's um, really appalling how far behind healthcare is. You know, um, I'm glad you brought up the issue that the vast majority of patients in this country are treated at community health centers, many of which are quite rural, as you mentioned. Um, I'm a breast cancer doctor. I, you know, spent all my time trying to stay current with breast cancer treatment, which is changing quite quickly. Um, and for the oncologist, the single oncologist in a small rural hospital who's treating patients with every type of cancer, there's no way that that person's going to have um, the ability to be absolutely up to date on every cancer. And we do have a lot of that we could help if we don't. And I've published and others have published uh, data that show that patients who are treated at these smaller community centers have poorer survival. Uh, we know that they don't do well, and you should not have your likelihood of surviving impacted by your zip code. Yes. Uh, where you have, um, we want to be able in this country to figure out how to provide high level, high quality care uh, throughout the country. Right now, we don't do that. Yes, I agree. Sort of want to make a comment. Well, oh, go ahead, Zajay Sean. No, 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 please. I think we're on the same page. Go ahead, Grace. Um, earlier, Sharon, you had talked about the patient that may not be a good historian. But I'd like to play devil's advocate here and talk about the patients and families that are very engaged, that come yeah. super prepared, that have notes, that have a, um, all of their records highlighted, outlined, timelined, that have done research, that are printing scientific papers, that come with the clinical trial printouts. And a lot of physicians and care teams don't know what to do in this situation. They 
Um, so many do welcome them and, and immediately naturally engage in shared decision making, but many do balk. And I've been there where people get frustrated and you see the little sign, you know, don't confuse your Googling with my medical degree. And uh, it's like oil and water. And I think we need to recognize that um, we're calling patients consumers. We want them to be engaged in their care and empowered in their care. But when they show up like that, we don't know what to do with them. So we need to be mindful of that, that there is a big cultural shift happening from doctor knows best to shared decision-making and participatory medicine and data needs to support that. So I think the theme is we need to make it easier for our, our oncologists and our care teams, but we also have to empower patients with that information. And I think we're seeing great strides with the Cures Act and the information blocking rules being implemented and people having access, but we have to shift the way that we do work, whether it's um, Larry, well, I'm sure when you're talking to a patient saying, hey, you might get these results before I have had time to review them, um, come up with a contingency plan, connecting patients um, to peer health support groups and, mm -hmm. and uh, nonprofits and places that they can go and speak to. So they're not this, uh, don't have this feeling of being alone, like they're the only person on the planet that's walking with this diagnosis. I agree with you, Grace, and I think there's um, a, a role for technology to play in uh, the community space as well to improving the patient experience. I just wanted to make a comment to uh, one of the questions, and that is, um, isn't generating structured data going to be much more uh, a burden on providers? And actually, I think the opposite is true. Um, and so we're um, experimenting now actively at Penn with uh, what we call smart forms in our EHR that do two things. One is they make sure that the clinician who's seeing the patient, in fact, addresses each issue that they should address with the patient. But it's also a way of addressing it with clicks and choices that then populate a clinic note with very, very clear structured data, whereas what they were doing without this was basically sitting there typing it out and logging. Um, getting what they should be doing there, and in fact, uh, often, um, you know, aside from punching structured data, it's taking a long time uh, to do. So I think that there are, in fact, um, time savings and efficiency enhancements um, with structured data. I agree with you, um, Larry, and we've worked a little bit on that in my company, building out a uh, structured encounter note template for clinicians so that they can go through um, all of the steps um, within their note. It also, besides allowing them to capture the data in a structured form, it decreases copy paste errors. It also, um, we also provide a back end for a uh, billing auditing and optimized billing, um, you know, decision making for your billing. And we um, pre populate, you, you know, helping the clinician pre populate from your last note, like from your last assessment and plan. What are the issues that you need that you uh, identified last time that you want to address now? And it, and it, provides not only the structured data, but it eases the burden on the clinician. It, we're you know, trying to get rid of that pajama time where they have to spend doing their clinical notes because you're right, the, the EMR right now is like opening up your Word, new, new document and Word and starting from scratch every time you write a note. And there's no reason that technology can't assist clinicians in this effort. Um, and at the same time, provide the benefit of generating structured data. Great. Uh, if I can, I'd like to ask Grace a question based on something that she mentioned a little bit earlier. We talked a bit about structured data and the value to the patient and the value to the provider. But Grace, you mentioned earlier that there are many other players in the ecosystem of care that comes to surround a patient during one of these journeys. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experiences with 
you know, is structured data available to the social security people, uh, team or to the food disparities, uh, clinic, you know, the food pantry or what have you? And if it was not, how might things be better if it were? That is such a great question. And I will tell you, everything is paper-based. So whenever I, I'm very vocal on Twitter, whenever I post a lot of these things that I run into, um, someone will say, no, well, there's people working in their standards and this is being exchanged. Um, perhaps somewhere where it really works well, but the reality is, um, whether you're a patient with advanced cancer that needs a PET scan or an MRI and your insurance company denies it, even though your board certified oncologist or physician has prescribed it as per the clinical uh, guide standard guidelines, um, it's being denied because it's not medically necessary. And often when you call the insurance company or Larry has to call for a peer to peer and waste, you know, 45 minutes of his time explaining why it's medically necessary, they don't have the proper documentation, they don't have the proper supporting documents, it's been sent to the entirely wrong department, for example, an oncology case will go to a cardiology expert, um, and then needs to be transferred. So um, things are being faxed. So I don't know where the structured data is, but if we can get it to where it's supposed to go, we're going to eliminate a lot of bottlenecks. You mentioned a food pantry. I help patients who need um, housing vouchers, who need social, who are on social security. It is all paper-based. It is all paper-based where they have to go and fill it out. Then they have to go to maybe a, a UPS store because if you are a housing insecure person with cancer, um, you most likely don't have access to a scanner and fax machine. So now you're going to UPS paying $2 for the first page and a dollar per page to have um, a stranger because you can't fax it yourself. Now you're giving your medical records to someone. So there's your patient privacy. You really don't know if it, it's gone through and there's no human being to talk to on the other end to confirm that they've received it. I have someone that I've worked with who was guaranteed, who was qualified for food stamps, um, a disabled individual, and it's now three months. They still have not gotten their uh, funds. Um, again, paper-based, snail mail, uh, there's no way to, to, to show and verify what the income is, what the diagnosis is. These are things that you should be able to do at the touch of a button on your phone. You can't see it because of my background that I could do click, 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 and it should be very straightforward. If I, as a patient, have my medical records, I can do the work that I need to do, but instead it's a very tedious process because not that this is a technology issue, it is a priority issue. And these priorities can be easily fixed with structured data. Data. We are trying to do that space and working with several of our players um, and figuring out actually with MITRE and ENCODE and Flatiron and several other partners how to create the structured data that's necessary for pre authorization, for chemotherapy, for imaging, and so on, and transfer that data automatically um, from our EHR to the payer. Um, and avoid not only talking to the wrong person on the other end, which of course um, drives me crazy uh, and takes up a lot of my time that I might otherwise spend with the patient, uh, but uh, also frequently delays your therapy. You know, we sometimes have to wait one or two weeks until we get a pre-authorization uh, to go ahead and treat the patient with something they desperately need yesterday. Um, and the goal of this uh, will be in fact, to get instantaneous approvals if the data that we transmit um, is appropriate. And uh, we think it will be, uh, but it just goes exactly to your point, which is um, that right now, medicine is you know, decades behind banking and so many other industries um, out there, not to mention Amazon. Uh, and you know, the patients are the ones who suffer for this. Um, and uh, frankly, the physicians don't do so well with it either. Uh, but you're the one who's waiting for that scan, waiting for the pre authorization to go through. You're the one who's waiting to start your treatment while we're waiting for the pre authorization and so on. So, very, very important points. I think you brought up something too, um, Larry, um, that, that draws on what Grace had said earlier about you know, within a family, who's the, who's the digital savvy person um, and being able to overcome that digital divide. 
but there's an equally challenging obstacle on the clinical side in terms of adoption of new technology. And you see this, um, there are a lot of, there, there can be a lot of um, resistance on the medical side for adopting new technology. And that's something that needs to be overcome. And maybe Larry wants to talk about that, um, what he's seen amongst his colleagues in terms of technology adoption. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's really an important point. Um, you know, uh, I got my colleagues to um, adopt one of the first EHRs in the 1990s and computerized chemotherapy ordering, all of which was new back then. Um, they were sure that the sky was falling uh, and uh, that we were ruining the art of medicine, which they told me over and over again. Uh, but, um, you know, you just have to persist that it happens, you know. How long did it take for uh, people to trust having their checks uh, electronically deposited in their account? You know, now, you know, it's like second nature. So you just need to push and eventually people come around. Uh, but uh, one of my colleagues once said, you know, all change is to be resisted. And um, it's hard for people to change, but uh, if we do it right, uh, it won't take them long to figure out how much better this is. So we have to do it right. And we've not, we've had a bunch of missteps uh, with electronic health records. So we need to get better. We need to start going in the right direction. So I want to just quickly be mindful of time. We only have a few minutes left for this panel. So I would encourage members of the audience, if you have a last question to uh, bring into the Q&A, please do so. But Grace, I think we'll uh, turn it over to you. We've received a question regarding uh, patient consent and how that uh, interacts with this ecosystem of freely transferring information. So I would love to uh, get your comments and thoughts on that question. Well, I love that question. Uh, I'm a big pro uh, proponent of trust and patient consent, but personalized patient consent and having the tools and technology to empower people and patients with personalized data segmentation and choices as to how their information flows in the ecosystem. HIPAA is, in my personal and professional opinion, inadequate and has too many gray areas and gaps that don't protect this new world that we're in where information can flow through APIs. Um, there's a big education component. Uh, many people don't know that their information is made electronically available, de-identified, aggregated, and used for various business operation purposes and commercial purposes. But many people do want to contribute. And I think if I had that transparency and knowing what my data can power um, and the choices, maybe I don't want Google to have my data. Maybe I, I'm an Apple fan and I want it to go there. I should have that choice as a consumer because we do call patients consumers. But the reality is we haven't been empowered with those types of um, control and ownership. Um, there's many groups that are trying to make a dent in this. I highly recommend everyone looks into the Light Collective, who is a big um, champion for patient digital rights, as well as maybe the Karen Alliance, who has a trusted code of conduct that they have crafted for um, information that flows through, for example, the API uh, ecosystem. So a lot of good work being done, but more work to do for sure. Fantastic. And I see that we are coming to the end of our time today, perhaps as a uh, uh, a last question and topic of conversation for each of the panelists. Uh, I would love to get your opinions on, given all of the information gaps and the values of standardization versus the burdens of standardizing data today, from each of your perspectives, what do you see as the one thing that needs to occur within the next couple of months, year or two year, to really sort of change the ecosystem from your perspectives. Uh, said differently, what could efforts like MCODE or the communities around it like Codex really take on in the next six months, year, two years to change the way that this uh, conversation is going for the people we're serving? Uh, perhaps to begin the conversation, Sharon, can I turn it to you? So I think that um, it's really 
what comes to the top and surface for me is all around the data standards. So like I had mentioned earlier, we don't have data standards for how we are capturing chemotherapy. We don't have data standards around how we capture um, other pieces of information within the oncology space. And I, in figuring out what those data standards are and agreeing upon them across the community is really going to be key to how we move forward in using the information. And I'll give an example in a clinical trial space, which I know that MCODE and MITRE are working on, right? So because um, clinical trial matching is so difficult, it's a 2x problem, which means that on the clinical trial side, there's no standards and how the clinical strand, there's no standards and in how inclusion and exclusion criteria are written um, so that that can be a standard in a standard format so that it can be matched to the patient side where there are also not standards in terms of how um, the patient's information is uh, recorded so that you can do the matching on the two sides by having you know, unstructured un, uh, data on the clinical trial side and then unstructured data that's not standard and, and categorized on the patient side, that matching is, in t is, is so human and labor intensive. So coming up with standards in all of the different parts of the ecosystem within oncology and having agreement and implementation of those data, data standards is a, a for me, the foundation of moving us to the next level in terms of information uh, sharing. Oh, thank you. Uh, Grace, how about you uh, take that one next? Mm -hmm. So I joined the USCDI task force and have been learning a lot this year. And my understanding and major takeaway is that if we want particular data elements and classes and structured pieces to be exchanged freely, there needs to be well vetted developed standards. In order for those standards to be developed, because everything needs a standard, you can only do so many because we have limited working force and power to, to develop those standards. I encourage everyone to really understand what are the most high priority real world use cases for data exchange. If we're talking about patient uh, engagement, what do patients really need? The example that Larry and I talked about, about insurance appeals and denials, that would help both sides. What data elements, um, so um, MCOR should be in harmony with, with USCDI is doing, what is missing and make priorities for standards development and pull people in. We need more people, including patients, including um, care partners to help with this um, all hands on deck effort in order to really move the needle. You know, Thank so you. I, and Larry, final comments. It was just emphasize what Sharon and Grace said. And I think when you listen to them, um, the basis for all of this is standardized structured data. It affects clinical trials, it affects payer um, interactions, it affects the ability of clinicians to use the EHR, it affects the patient's ability to get the data that they need to get um, in a usable, accessible way. Everything relies on standardized structured data, and we've done a lousy job of that. Um, the U.S. is a very fractured system. Uh, all of our centers use different EHRs, and uh, some of them bear the same name. Uh, they're all developed a little bit independently. There's so many problems in the way that we provide care here, uh, but we need a will. We need a national will to really say that you know we need to get over the entropy of, um, of not doing this. And it's actually not that difficult. And I think MITER and ENCODE have made tremendous strides in doing this. Uh, others have failed in this path before them, uh, but uh, there are reasons why I believe that this can be successful and that it's gaining uh, momentum. But we need, we need support and push from the patient advocacy group uh, we need push from the payers, we need push from our clinicians. Everybody's got to be rolling in the same direction. But without those structured, standardized data, none of these problems are going to get fixed. 
Brilliant. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to encourage you all uh, by uh, saying that this is not the end of the conversation. If you would like to continue or take part in any of these conversations or making some of these concepts a reality, we welcome you to uh, investigate MCODE, the Codex community, and see how each of you might be a part of that. But on behalf of my incredible panel today, I want to thank you all for your time, your attendance, and your attention, and I'll throw it over to the uh, health team to wrap us up.